Hi, all. we're going to give people just a few more minutes to log on. Thanks. Well, Sarah, I think we have enough people on that we can go ahead and kick off. Is Sounds that good. acceptable? I am. Yes, I accept that. <laughs> okay, so I'll just welcome everybody to day two. I'll, um, day one was very useful and I was on a meeting earlier today and uh, we were talking about the, this, this meeting from yesterday. So that, that's a good sign we're leaving an impression. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, next slide. I think it's Patrick. All right, thank you. Uh, so just reviewing our, our meeting roles, uh, the same ones from yesterday. Uh, so Amanda will be our uh, mute master, raised hand monitor and general security. Uh, I will be splitting today the screen sharing responsibilities with Julie. Uh, Sarah will be updating our slides. Becky and Stan will be our moderators. Uh, we have a full PM team for note takers and Q&A monitors, and then Sarah will also be our time watcher. Um, so if you have any questions, our Slack handles are included here as well, uh, and we will be monitoring the Zoom chat as additionally. Um, so if you have any questions during the event, uh, for verbal questions, please use the raise hand feature. I thought that we did very well with that yesterday. Um, as a reminder, it's under the participants tab. You should have a button there. Or if you go to your reactions panel, uh, there'll be a raise hand button there as well. Additionally, uh, please do feel free to add questions in Zoom chat. And the person who is monitoring the chat for that session uh, will be sure to call out to the moderator. Uh, or you can use Slack. I know we had a few people using Slack yesterday, um, and I thought that it was a uh, very good forum. Um, so thank you for participating there as well. And just a reminder uh, for moving uh, between any breakouts that we strongly encourage you using the latest version of Zoom, which will allow you to move between breakouts. And with that, Stan, I will hand it back to you. I'll go ahead and read this again because we may have some people who have joined us for the second day that were unable to join us the first day. We have a, a code of conduct for all of our meetings and uh, the Biodata Catalyst Consortium is dedicated to providing a harassment free experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion or the lack of religion. We do not tolerate harassment of community members in any form and sexual language and imagery is generally not appropriate for any venue, including meetings, presentations, or discussions. And next slide, please. We also um, follow what we hope we are starting to create a, a standard around is the Santa Cruz rules of engagements. Please do not be shy from identifying problems and risks. We did a very good job yesterday of of voicing our concerns and things that we were worried about. We urge people to be very candid. We also urge you to be heard. We understand that some people have a harder time than others, so please identify an ally or ask for some help via Slack if need be. Um, if you have a contact for a particular topic, you can reach out, and if you don't know the contact, you can reach out to bdc3 at redsea.org. And please, be polite. Um, one a new addition for today since yesterday is that we would like you to use your full name on Zoom because identifying folks is important. Everybody's welcome, but we need to know who's who's here. If you're a talker, please remember to give others the time and space to talk. And if you're generally a quiet person, please try to take advantage of any opening or we will try to help. And add your comments and ideas to the notes if you don't find the space to talk and the notes. Again, you can reference back to the prior slide and be able to reach a link to the notes. Next slide, please. 
So today we are going to um, first do the breakout report backs with discussions, and we've given variable amounts of time depending upon how much time we expect things to take. I'll be wrapping things up so I probably can absorb any little overages. Then we've asked Brian to give us a discussion on our relationship with GA4GH and what we might want to do in the future. Then we'll be breaking for lunch from 12.15 to 2 p.m. It's a little longer than normal because NIH is going to have a breakout among the group that um, is generally the NCPI working group internally so that they can discuss uh, and give us guidance on prioritization of the next steps. Um, that's by invitation only. Um, then uh, Saya has been gracious enough to offer to lead a discussion around uh, use cases. Uh, and then finally, um, th th we're going to have a panel discussion with moderators. And then by 3.20 or so, uh, John and I are going to try to synthesize goals and next steps for the next six months with a focus where we can find uh, the right use cases that will try to drive drive the, the next six months activities. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think this is over to whom? This is your Stan. Ah, so we want to make sure that what we hear in the breakout reports um, is captured. And so if there are use cases that you see emerging from the discussions, and there were some yesterday, that we need to highlight or clarify. We need to kind of identify what we need to do next. And then ultimately we need to distill those next steps into some priority order so that we pick the things that we think we can get done in the next six months. I hope that makes sense, so be on the alert. Um, one other meeting delivery, and it's actually starting to shape up nicely. Um, the NCPI glossary is being assembled. We're not expecting it to be a glossary where everything is defined definitively. Instead, we're trying to gather um, a concrete list of the views of as many people as we can on glossary terms that may not be necessarily agreed upon. So ultimately, we hope we can settle in on some common definitions or at least highlight some differences. Next slide. Okay, Becky, this one's over to you. Thanks, just struggling with mute this morning. So welcome to day two, thanks for that stand. We're going to start off the day by doing report backs from the breakout sessions that were yesterday. I know the leads were working to synthesize what I think were very meaty conversations that happened during the breakout. So we're going to, um, kick it over to Bob Grossman to start. And I would just remind, um, we'll be posting time reminders in the chat uh, because I know it is a real challenge to summarize some of these conversations, but we're gonna try and stay on track today. Um, thank you. Uh, so I, I taught yesterday um, and Alex Vanto um, um, was the uh, represented PFB. Um, and uh, I, he and I talked and I went over his notes. So this is a summary. So um, sticking to the format for the breakout reports, um, what are the gaps? Um, just to uh, remind people what we've done to date is um, PFB is an encapsulated format that includes data and the data model, um, but it doesn't specify a data model. In the NCPI, uh, I just want to make sure this is the right, hopefully I edited the right set of notes, but um, we'll, we'll find out as I go through these. Um, the, um, uh, the PFB light that we use for NCPI interoperative today has uh, 13 attributes, they're listed there. And this is used um, when, to, when you're interoperating, you've selected a cohort, um, and you, you need to pass enough information to pull the um, relevant BAM CRAM files using DRS. So that's a basic interoperability problem. Um, um, uh, PFB is also used with a different data model 
um, for which is sometimes a platform specific to go from the between two pieces of interoperability, say Gen 3 and um, a, 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 a Terra or something uh, or Seven Bridges or one of the other workspaces. So um, that's just as background. The, 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 I think the next um, uh, the one blocker is we don't carefully distinguish between these two and other use cases. Um, and I think to make further progress, it would be helpful to very carefully to distinguish the use cases currently in production in NCPI and others that we might want. And I'll come to that in a minute. So um, I've listed that as, um, um, uh, uh, as identifying the next set of use cases for interoperability that includes both data objects such as BAM and CRAM files and structured data such as clinical phenotype. Uh, next slide. Um, I, just uh, to, to remind you of some trade-offs and these were discussed in the uh, breakout session. Um, you can compete when you're selecting a virtual cohort and you need the associate all the enough data to pass to a workspace um, and um, when you need that you typically you need to compute pfb on the fly which can take some time both time to generate it especially if it's a it's a big collection of files and times to ingest it and parse it um, there's a trade-off between allowing the flexibility to do virtual cohort selection in the fly in one platform and consume that data in another platform, export in one platform, import into the other, versus um, maybe selecting studies or associate studies or projects or research cases of interest in which the PFB is pre-computed, and then you just have to import or reference that in the workspace. So that's one trade-off. Um, the other trade-off is the flexibility of having different data models. We already use several data models within um, um, NCPI, and I've mentioned just a few of these for PFB versus supporting arbitrary models that must be parsed by the cloud platform. Now, the advantage of formats like Avro and the protocol buff is you can um, use an arbitrary model and essentially have enough logic to, um, uh, to parse that arbitrary model and bring it in. On the other hand, um, um, that requires a little more code than if you have a fixed model. So those are the trade-offs. Next slide. Um, gaps, um, confusion about what PFB is and is not. Um, uh, the uh, the, the uh, time required to generate PFPs on the fly versus pre-computing that I just talked about. And then clarifying the differences and similarities between self-describing format like PFB, the NCBI VDB format we heard about yesterday that's been used for over a decade, um, other self-contained self-describing formats like protocol buffers um, versus FHIR. Um, and they're, they're really very different, but that confusion, I think, sometimes leads to, to questions. Next slide. This is the last slide for next steps. Um, and again, I want to thank the breakout group and thank the note takers and thank the sort of long, the discussions I had yesterday working this out with Alex um, and Peter. Um, um, so what are the next possible steps? Um, we've already mentioned, I think, uh, um, distinguishing the different use cases, but we need to document that. We have the, the PFB light. Um, we have use cases we export between two, from one platform and import to another, all the clinical phenotype data. Um, and then, you know, what might be interesting, and this is a possible next step, is unlike FHIR and some of the other formats, which are sort of transaction patient oriented, um, PFB can have an arbitrary model, and that model can be used, for example, to do AI ML ready data sets. So what might be interesting is to take some published studies around AI ML in the um, commons in NC, one or more of the commons in NCPI, create a, a, you know, a self-contained PFB file with all the necessary data from that that's already in the platforms 
um, and then to um, use that as a use case to see how we can export that from one study, from one platform and import it to another um, or another use case. So I think the, the, the real issue is to get a use case that we can sort of demonstrate something more than PFB like. That, that's all I have. Thanks again to the, to the breakout group. Thanks for that, Bob. Uh, we have a moment for one or two questions. If anybody's got questions for Bob or Alex, if he's on the line. Okay, otherwise I'm gonna hand it uh, to Robert Carroll to give us an overview of what I, I know because I was in a very meaty fire discussion. Stan, I see your hand for a minute. Do you wanna, do you have a question? Uh, I do. So. In another meeting earlier today, the topic of fire being used for search came up. And is there anybody that's on the call that can talk to why that turns out to be a useful, that why fire turns out to be a useful uh, mechanism for that? Because I thought it was quite interesting yesterday and the fact that it came up again today um, leads me to believe that not all of us understand that. That's a great point. Dan, I'm glad you raised that, but I'm going to suggest maybe that we hold that question oh. and let Robert go through the slides and then maybe we can circle back to it. Oh, sure. That's fine. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. My timing is off here because I was looking ahead in the slides. I apologize. Go ahead, Robert. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So I think we had a great conversation yesterday as well. And then some, some of these questions, I think, to Stan's point and some of those conversations about the distinctions and the potential roles. So I've got two slides here. The first one is sort of what are those gaps and key blockers? Um, I think one of them is the adoption across platforms. And I think specifically, uh, we address this a little bit, but what, what are the roles of FIRE you know, or role or roles of FIRE in the different platforms? And how can that actually serve some of these interoperability use cases? And I think that's to the second point there that there hasn't been a, a clear documentation of the uses of fire. Um, and I, I know some of us have grand plans and have, have been thinking a lot about it, but I think oftentimes it, we get stuck in a fire is one thing. And so we have just conversations like to the point of the glossary, right? That it's, there's a, maybe multiple roles. And so it's just not clear. It's hard to communicate because it's a, we have a really big complex system we're all building together here. So, and then also that map to communicate what are the specific goals um, for those groups building fire services and you know doing the fire data transformations and what will the limits of those be, um, especially as, so as we're building a roadmap. And so I think a lot of it is you know the informational, there's, there's a sense of, we do have practical next steps and use cases that we're working on, uh, but I think the biggest blockers um, for adoption right now are, are really that, the lack of clarity and uh, communication on, on what some of those objectives are and, and how we're going to do them, you know, in, in these powerful ways, service oriented ways. So the actionable next steps that we have, I think there are a few. So I've, <laughs> I, I took a little bit of liberty with this one. And I think one of the areas, and this is what Sam was talking about with search and some of these potentially search and some of these other areas is really trying to align on the research study and this metadata version one representation. And so I think that aligns with some really pressing use cases um, from the NCBI side about the, the work they're doing. I think it also is a little bit easier because you, if it's public facing data, standing up those services doesn't have the same kind of burden um, as far, it's a lot easier to share and collaborate. And so I'm excited for that. And I think the idea here would be to help facilitate those portal and search activities. Um, I think that there's a really could be a lot of power here. And for us, I think we it will we will be continuing to develop the row level transformations and making that and, and preparing to make that data available. But there are some barriers that I don't know if we'll be able to knock out in the next six months. Like I said, again, specifically about the security and compliance. Um, there are some great tools out there now. Uh, and I, I think I've got this on the next slide. Too, so, but one second on that. And then to develop and, sorry, can we go back to the one thing yet? To develop and promulgate the set of milestones around services, those use case limitations, and to work with the platforms to identify roadmaps for these opportunities. And so I think specifically, we want to set up what are those use cases? What are those milestones? What are those sort of problems that, you know, we can, this toolkit of fire to help solve? Um, so it's more clear. And then tell everyone, hey, an anvil, we really are planning these milestones, you know, in this cadence. So it's clear to say, hey, this is what the benefit from us might be to implement this, or 
okay, cool. So you, you guys are taking point on that. You know, you're going to run into a bunch of challenges maybe as you, as you refine things. That's how, that's how you know, we know we can participate in, in what your objectives are. And so I think that's, once again, one of the really the biggest gaps, I think, to the collaboration is trying to make that clear. Um, where Because, you know, I've been just charging forward. I've got a sense of what, I, what we're trying to do. And so just work and work and work. And, but that's not really helpful to everyone else. Um, so trying to make that clear. And that, once again, I think that'll be really helpful to have those clearly defined product milestones, as well as then building the roadmaps, which might look different for different groups. And as everyone may have different priorities. Um, you know, I think the Kids First team is standing up those row level data services, right? They should be maybe ready even this week. And so that looks different than what it will for Amble, and that's okay. But then it's clear to everyone. So that was the biggest piece. Um, the next slide, I wanted to touch on this. This, this was a quick fire use cases. We talked about it. I took some of the notes um, and thanks. I think John, you were taking notes yesterday. It was wonderful. I really appreciate it. To kind of hit this, put a bunch of links in here, talk about some of those fire use cases. And these are, this is a, once again, one slide really quick foundation of some of the areas we're thinking about, about where can fire make a difference, right? Because we've got a data model, we have vocabulary tools, and we have these service layers um, like the REST API that all play potential roles in different parts. So one of the big ones, right, ingesting EHR data through the federal mandates of EHR to support fire for interoperability. Um, and th this is a link out to the USCDI, which is the ONC's, the Office of National Coordinator of Health IT's specific requirements on what must EHR support. And so that's a great resource. Um, the next is ingest of other data, which I think can be really helpful. Right now is a, a whole lot of manual work uh, on somebody's end to manage the complexity of the different clinical phenotypic data. So there's some link out to some other tools that are out there um, from REDCap team, from the NLM. So vocabulary tools to help support existing standards and local or custom definitions. And I think this is something that is, once again, about the data ingest. Um, that's being able to connect with whatever the people provided, whatever that you know custom data dictionary from the study originally collected, as well as linking over to um, those standard vocabularies like SNOMED or some of these others to really help empower the semantics of the data. There's, and this is back to, we can represent data in a structured way as is. We can also do, a, we can work towards that robust harmonized way um, for certain data sets with the right investment on platforms or research studies or you know whoever bears that time and effort burden, but we can actually kind of set up the framework for that. There's options for server implementations. I think this is one of the key nice parts about Fire for this global standard that we don't have to invent. Um, you know, all the major cloud platforms have a Fire service that you can just go and you know with a few clicks get get running, which is really helpful. There's a few open source services also, um, and so I think there's a lot of great tools there. And then once again, it's, and then it's about exchanging those data from disparate systems in a common way. And even if the content isn't totally harmonized. Uh, which I know we'd all love to have, if it's at least structured consistently, that it allows a little bit more, um, makes life a little bit easier sort of on, on those other services. Um, like all, all the, back to search as an easy, easy example, um, but even to researchers as well. And I know there's some use cases we'll talk about later that touch on this. And then, yeah, there's some op options for study summaries and metadata that I think are really great. Um, and also that ability to link out to DERS URIs and, and that kind of thing. So you can always go back to the original data. You can always link out to the same DERS URIs that we're already building to, you know, provide access to genomics data. You know, we don't take any of that away. It, it really can accentuate and complement each other. So those, that's some of it, food for thought. We'll be definitely circling up on building out those roadmaps and continuing to do the work that we're, that we're doing, of course, but hopefully finding a way to communicate all, all of these complex pieces to help people understand and hopefully motivate and find ways to engage like, hey, this is something that I think would be useful for our platform or for our users. So I think that covers it. And happy to answer questions if we have time. All right, thanks for that, Robert. I know you covered a lot of ground in that summary, so much appreciated. Anybody that's, well, before I call open, let's circle back to Stan's question a little bit, Robert. I know you sort of touched on this related to kind of how fire can be used to search. Um, Stan, do you ha have a follow-up or are there, there sort of items that could use additional clarification? 
so I I do, and I realize that I misspoke because um, I I wondered actually if there are advantages in or leverage to be had is a better way to put it, and I was hoping to get an answer for both PFB and Fire. Now maybe there is no advantage in trying to use PFB format in a search setting, but certainly it's true that people are using fire in a search setting. And I just wanted to try to understand why one or the other formats would, would su supply us with some ability that I, we I wonder, wouldn't otherwise have. Sorry. I, I think it's really great, Santa, to bring this up because I, I sort of feel, and I, I sort of express this uh, to, to Robert and, and Allison as well, that, uh, that there's a little bit of a, a misconception that it's sort of this is my interpretation, sort of PFB versus fire decision. Um, I don't feel like they're the same sort of fruit or, or even that they're both fruits. Um, uh, you know, I, I think fire definitely has data export functionalities, but I think what Robert's trying to highlight is that there are all these layers of services and existing infrastructure that support the access and query of fire-based tools in ways that, uh, you know, I think um, I think essentially are sort of pre-built and um, into uh, the healthcare ecosystem and are going to be more and more entrenched as part of that with, you know, and additionally, we didn't talk about this, but there's a whole large-scale economic commercial investment in FIRE that's beginning to also grow. Uh, this is true for Google, AWS, Azure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just worry sometimes that, it, that people are framing it sort of a PFB versus fire. Um, I don't know if Robert, if you have sort of comments on this, um, just doesn't feel like that that's the right framework. Yeah, Bob has his hand raised too. I mean, I, I, think, I think you're right, Adam. The, the thing is, I, we're, we're, I'm really wanting to be opinionated uh, yeah, what you said, there's a lot of investment in the community right now on the tools, things I don't have to worry about, but I, I'm really invested also in the data modeling aspect, which is something that PFB is very intentionally not telling you how to do it. And so I think there's potential for synergy there because, uh, yeah, and to be able to mint and, and do that, I think that uh, PFBs and, and send that, that's that's all fine. You know, there, there's, a, there's a role and purpose for that. Um, but yeah, I want to be more opinionated about the content. Uh, we yeah. Do you want to chime in? Yeah, um, I, I just want to. I, I I tried to say this in the talk that there's absolutely. I mean, fire is a mandate. It's built into the ecosystem. We have to interoperate with fire and use it in all possible ways. I mean, that that's a given. Um, the, the the role of PFB is much more narrow. First of all. It's a fire. It's a it's a it's a file file. It's a file format, so it doesn't come with a server. It doesn't come with an API. It doesn't come with something you search over. If you want to search PFB, you load them. We typically load them into Elasticsearch and then search over Elasticsearch. So they're not comparable. Um, they so this is not an, it, every time we phrase it as PFB versus fire, we lose. We are going to be using. Fire. The question is, when you have a large, complicated ecosystem, there are specialized interoperability that you have to do, and you want it to be very efficient. And so those are why Avro and other formats are used. You also want long-term archival storage of and versioning and all sorts of other things that sometimes are simpler to do with file formats, file for, with self-describing um, file formats that are designed for import and export. So I, I just want to emphasize what Adam said more eloquently, what Robert said, it's not one versus the other, it's just in complicated ecosystems, you want interoperability through inter importing and exporting in particular formats for bulk data that are self-describing. And that's why um, the breakout suggested getting use cases. Um, I, I, so I think at a high level, I'm agreeing with everyone, um, but I, we really want to be precise about these questions. Stan? 
You're muted, Stan. I, I appreciate the comments, and it's very it's very helpful. And I think actually, Bob, I um, will just uh, further reinforce what you just said. I think it we really need to create some use cases, and then ask ourselves what is the right technology to employ for these various use cases. So for example, if I was trying to do an electronic health record cohort analysis, FHIR might be particularly apropos. And th this is this to me is very exciting because we're starting to get collections of standards that are at our disposal to try to understand when we're gonna deploy them. So I just think this has been a, a fantastic discussion and it's really enlightened me. And I guess if I could just say one last note about search um, specifically, you know, I think why you're hearing more on the fire side is because the fire API does have search capabilities out of the box. And I agree, they aren't necessarily the most, you know, robust or resilient, but maybe to Robert's point, if we have an opinionated way of representing data in fire, you can do basic search on, you know, the fire servers, but even we're looking at that architecture of then exporting it to Elasticsearch for more robust, fast search. But since you already made an opinionated kind of decisions on how you're representing in fire, it suddenly becomes easier to export it into something like Elasticsearch across different systems uh, if you want to do faster aggregation. So, you know, I totally agree with the different fruits and vegetables and meat products or whatever we're assessing uh, across uh, the landscape there and that they all have, you know, strengths that are bringing it in. But I, I think that's likely why you're hearing more of the, the search aspect on the fire stuff. And I think people are wondering how far can we push it? I think it will break at some point, uh, but I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, and I, I put the, the search piece in there too. It, it's, it's a space of, there's tons of sources of vocabularies. Where, what, are you, what are you using? Are you using UMLS to define all of your pieces? Are you, but that's never going to have, um, right, the custom vocabulary from some random study you loaded up. And so there's not really this bridge right now between like what the, could DBF has a ton of robust information and they're also looking to lift that up into fire. And so how do you how do you bridge that? And it gives you a language that's consistent, even if it's not the best operationally, like Allison's describing, it may be too wordy, it may be too complex for what this particular user wants to do. But at the same time, it gives you that foundation so you can provide the services. So I think Doug's an example there. So I can say, just like Doug is pulling from dbGaP XML data dictionaries, I can say, hey, I've got another option for you. Like you now, yeah, you can index all these, these terms here. And whether that's coming from dbGaP or coming from a user provided data or from another study that maybe isn't flowing through the dbGaP mechanisms, like there's, there's that consistency or, or. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. I'm gonna cut us off so we can move on, but I really think this was important to kind of get through because uh, Robert, as you hinted at, there is a fair amount of confusion on here. And I, I do think we're gonna begin hearing a trend this morning about the usefulness and the criticality of developing use cases to explain sort of what roles these different standards play. So with that, um, I wanna um, hand it over to Brian O'Connor who's gonna cover the RAS breakout. Great, okay, so the RAS breakout, I basically translated um, our notes that we took in the RAS breakout. It was, I thought a really great conversation. Um, we could have kept the conversation going much longer, um, but I, you know, I think at the end of the day, we, we covered the, the, the biggest topic, which was, what we specifically focused on is what are the collective concerns about milestone three? This is the transition from just using RAS for authentication for sort of user login and identity to also using it for authorization. That's what milestone three is referring to. So um, in terms of what we perceive as risks collectively, uh, the group came up with a few um, key areas. One, people are pointing out um, concerns about a timeline, right? The overall timeline is, okay, by the end of Q1 2022, what we're going to have RAS rolled out for authorization in these systems. Um, specifically, the DIRS servers are going to accept RAS passports. Um, so people are concerned about two things. One, um, getting up a testing environment um, running. So people that are going to um, develop the clients that understand how to, to use a RAS passport to access um, a data file um, have something to test against, and two, the overall sort of production uh, release timeline of of end of Q1 uh, 2022. Um, so for the testing environment, um, the original timeline for that is I think it's early December. Um, if I look back, I want to say December 
um, 7th. So, so that was flagged as one of the sort of major risks that people are concerned about is, you know, what happens if we slip there. The other thing that came up was, you know, the architectural ideal versus implementing on existing services. I think this is something that Chicago brought up as a potential risk or concern. Um, another item that's been brought up multiple times and we brought it up again uh, yesterday is performance, right? So as we transition over to parsing potentially very large um, passports when making the decision about whether a user gets access to a data file or not, um, how is the performance going to be? And I think University of Chicago responded um, with the idea that, well, the December timeframe is time for us to put together an MVP. It may not be super performant, but it's compatible. It's presenting the right interface. And I think that approach is really savvy. And I think that approach is really helpful here that we have something to test against, but then continue to iterate on the performance. Um, but we do realize that performance could be um, a potential issue. And then um, I, don't know if this is really part of milestone three, but it came up in the conversation. So I'm putting it here, which is feedback from projects like Biodata Catalyst that wanting to see a more true single sign-on experience across the various systems. Again, I think that's slightly tangential to sort of RAS as an authorization um, system and what we're trying to do for milestone three, but it's something that we need to collectively keep in mind. And it's something that's been uh, feedback um, provided um, uh, over the last several months. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. Great, okay. So the other thing that we touched on really briefly, and I think this is something that is gonna continue to be discussed in systems interop or particular sort of RAS breakouts and individual um, projects, uh, but thinking about what is beyond milestone three. Um, so I think for me, the drumbeat here is we have to get to milestone three and please stay on time. You know, please deliver this on time. Like that's my drumbeat. But beyond milestone three, what what's on the horizon? And it's things like um, uh, performance, uh, batch operations, dealing with things like requester pays. So getting into more of the sort of um, uh, performance and requester pays um, aspects. Um, this is going to require sort of back and forth with implementers like Chicago, as well as the GA4GH. We'll talk about the GA4GH a little bit later today. Um, because this is going to look uh, need to look towards uh, modifications and, and future versions of things like DIRST to bring in um, batch operations. Um, another thing that's on the radar, we didn't really talk about it too much in the breakout. It was a little too short, but thinking through like what happens with workspaces that have derived data and how do they potentially inherit um, sort of the visas associated with original authorization. Um, another topic that came up uh, is how do we secure other APIs beyond DERS with uh, passports? So I, I know there was mention yesterday of, I think the DBGAP group, uh, NCBI group was looking at um, using passports to secure uh, their fire server. So this is something that I think we're gonna need to approach uh, beyond milestone three. Um, another topic uh, is related to how do we have a developer access list or consortium access list that live outside of um, dbGaP? Um, and how do we represent that as passports um, and support repackaging of passports uh, that are non-RAS based? So sorry, that's a bit in the weeds, but it's really trying to understand how we can use the passport infrastructure when we've got information, authorization information and visas beyond just what's in dbGaP. So these are covering things like developer access lists. Um, and then finally, um, going more broad here, thinking about the ecosystem of passport brokers and data sets beyond just our close-knit sort of NCPI and NIH community. Um, and that's really what the final bullet point is speaking to. Um, ben, did you wanna jump in here? Or do you wanna wait until um, I get to the end of the, the slides? Oh, 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 wait, thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, let's go to the next one then. Okay, so um, what are the actionable next steps for the next six months? Um, so here's, here's a straw, uh, straw man here. Uh, <laughs> first and foremost, please, let's meet our milestone three goals. I think that's our top priority. Drum beat here of like, let's stay on the timeline for that. Um, I think we should also 
as we you know convince ourselves that we're going to hit those timelines i think we should start planning like what is i hate to say it but what is a milestone four look like what do we need to work on in that next sort of iteration um, I think systems interop is a good sort of cross cutting group where we can talk about this. I know individual groups are going to be talking about this in their own sort of RAS and, and authentication and authorization meetings, but queuing up things like thinking about performance, derived data, securing other APIs and uh, consortium users and um, uh, developer access lists. Um, and I think the, the third pillar here is now is a great time for us to at least start thinking about and kind of making those connections but we'll be talking about the ga4gh in a bit i think there's uh, some good venues for this but starting to think about the other groups that use passports the international efforts that use passports and i know this is a concern or concern slash interest on the ga4gh side to understand how various groups around the world are starting to use passports and asking the question are we all using passports in the same way are our implementations of passports compatible with each other. So I think starting to think kind of beyond just the NIH RAS passports and looking at the larger ecosystem that could potentially give our users access to data beyond the 11 petabytes that we talked about um, yesterday. Um, okay, so that's, that's a whirlwind tour of the RAS breakout. Um, but then I can go ahead and take your question now and, and any, any other questions that we have. And I see Stan has his hand raised too. I, I I really appreciated your comment about RAS beyond the DB gap uh, permissions model, and would suggest that it's not just a matter of developer access, but but looking forward beyond milestone three or four, um, I I have a question in my head about how RAS applies to data in user created workspaces on analysis platforms. You know, mm -hmm. for example, if I create a workspace on Terra and import data from Biodata Catalyst, how, and then I want to add other users to my workspace on Terra, how does that intersect with RAS or DB gap controls? Right now it's a very trust-based model in which I as the workspace owner am responsible for ensuring everybody has appropriate access or permission. And I, I think there's real exciting opportunity, but it's a little longer term to think about how users might generate passports or how passports might control access to analysis platform workspaces. So I'm yeah. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of what I was getting at too when I was talking about the sort of derived data, like securing derived data, that same sort of um, uh, scenario that you were describing where I create a workspace, I populate it with Anvil and Biodata Catalyst data that I have access to. Now those DERS URIs are secured, right? So if I add someone that doesn't have access, they can't access the original data. So that's good, but it's all about the derived data. How does it work if I create some sort of summary and I wanna add someone to my workspace, but I wanna want also enforce that they have the same permissions um, that I do with the Anvil data and the BDCAT data. So how do we potentially carry the visas through to the workspace environments and kind of make them sticky to the workspace environments. So absolutely there's more to talk about there. Um, there's definitely ideas of how this could be done and how this should be done, but I think we're gonna have a lot more conversations there. That's great, Stan. So I guess what I'm really hoping to hear is that there's a good place for us to go to understand the details within RAS more completely. Brian, I'm, I'm hoping you can point us in the right direction. And the reason is, is that this discussion today has led me to believe that perhaps we need to think about how we credential people in a very mathematical way. And I don't know if that's being done already. If it is, that's fantastic. But I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, how do you take um, credentials from the EU and find an isomorphic version in, in RAS, and, and mm. I think it's going to have to define a language and an algebra. <laughs> I, yeah, I Stan, I think, it, I think it's really interesting because, you know, if we take a step back over the last year and a half, two years, we've gotten to the point where we see NIH researchers now kind of working across a huge amount of data. Like, so that's a huge win. I, I, I'm super happy with that. But then, of course, we've always got to have the next milestone, the next goalpost out there. And so now the scenario is, well, I think there's two areas of growth, obviously grow, growing 
the sort of data sets that, that people have access to within NIH projects and kind of growing our little NC PI ecosystem here. I'm, I'm all for that. That's kind of lower hanging fruit. But then there's also the sort of question we have, you know, people I'm sure can point to multiple sort of collaborations with um, the EU um, and other sort of, you know, groups out there, other large uh, national um, sort of initiatives and things like that, um, where we'd like users to be able to access data that spans, you know, EMBL EBI data sets and EGA data sets and our, our data sets here. So absolutely, I think this is, um, good that we're seeing similar technology adoption right that makes it easier but two i think it's time to start thinking longer term as well like how do we open up the whole ecosystem beyond the nih um, to our researchers which will be you know incredibly powerful thanks Great. thanks for that we're going to i think leave that there so we can uh, move along to the next report back. So thank you for that. I know um, there's a tremendous amount of interest and in work that's been done in RAS so far, but um, Michael Schatz is going to give the overview for um, end user cloud costs. Okay. I'm actually on campus today. So. All right. It's okay, Michael. You, um, kind of, we'll let you lower the blinds and then <laughs> take it away. I have, I have kind of a weird shadow. Anyway, so we had a very uh, lively discussion around cloud, uh, cloud costs. I mean, I think, you know, you know, in terms of gaps, I think we just really need to be really honest with ourselves that, you know, the, the cloud cost model is just this enormous cultural shift for our end users. You know, there's sort of, we, everyone kind of grew up in this culture where institutional resources are free. Of course, they're not really free, but, you know, to my students, to my postdocs, to my analysts, even to my own lab, you know, we get a lot of benefit from those institutional resources. So there's this big cultural shift with that brings a lot of anxiety about how is this going to work? You know, you know, great anxiety over runaway costs. It's it's quite a bit more difficult to budget for, to plan for, just getting, you know, kind of plugged into what the payment model is. You know, um, whenever I present on this, I always say go talk to Strides, but you know, even Strides has many options. Not everyone is necessarily um, um, eligible for that. So then, you know, researchers may have to talk to their own institutions. You know, maybe. Put it on their own payment card. You know, it's just um, it's it's complicated. And we have to be honest with that. We have to be um, get ahead of that. You know, th and that will come through both technical solutions, education, training. You know, we got to be really mindful about this. We also had a really lively discussion about you know what are the costs that we're talking about. I think when we talk about cloud computing costs, we tend to focus on the really technical components, like you know how much is this petabyte of data going to cost the store. Or, you know, if you get a virtual machine of a certain character of a certain of a certain settings, you know how much does that cost per hour or egress fees? But I think we also have to be honest about kind of the overhead costs or the sort of implicit costs associated with this. Um, you know, for me, for my students, they can just like literally SSH into the cluster. You know, it takes one second to do so, but you know, getting onto a new cloud port uh, platform realistically it takes hours, right? You have to learn how to do it. You have to get settings, you have to get accounts, billing accounts, it takes hours. And then there's these ongoing administrative costs. Um, you know, every month we get a bill, even if it's for $1 <laughs> for GCP or AWS or whatnot, if even a $1 bill has to get routed through, you know, financing and get approved. And, you know, these are, these are, these are um, real co uh, costs and burdens on time. So I don't. I, I think we we kind of get focused on, you know, computing costs or storage costs. But I think we got to be sort of honest that there's these administrative and sort of initialization costs. So that even if I offer someone you know hundreds of dollars in free credits, when you kind of think about the hours invested and the personnel and the people involved to take advantage of it, it's it's you know that's a that's a barrier. That's a gap that I think again we just got to be mindful of it. We got to speak to that. Um, and I think, you know, again, this is going to come through technical solutions. Can we make it easier? Can we optimize, you know, some of these um, onboarding activities? And then really sort of educate on the advantages. You know, we got to just make it so super compelling to use the cloud platform that, you know, they're going to be drawn to it, even if it does take an extra hour or whatnot to get set up. So um, I think there was some great discussion there. And then another sort of great discussion came up was, you know, how do we, how, what's like, what's the right model for thinking about costs? And, um, you know, there's several of us kind of brainstorming there. And I think of in the here and now, um, it's not gonna be practical to just come up with like an arbitrary whittle 
and just or 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 uh, CWL or some arbitrary workflow with some arbitrary data set and like very precisely estimate what it's going to cost. At some at some level, we're hitting up against like there's this famous program um, problem in computer science called the halting problem. Like, how can you even know when this program will ever end, if ever? And there's some like deep theory that says you can't even this like very basic question about when a program will end. You can't really always address. So it's basically a, um, impossible to predict from first principles exactly how long something's going to take, exactly what it's going to require. But the reality is um, certain uh, applications, certain uh, computes are very popular. We're going to need to do them all the time and do them over and over and over again. Um, and this is by analogy, I think that's true in experimental science as well. So, for example, you know, these days, whole genome sequencing with, say, Illumina. There's a very predictable protocol. There's very predictable costs. Yeah, once in a while you'll get a bad run, but I don't know, probably 99% of the time or better, you know, the costs, the complexity are really well understood. On the other hand, there are these um, experimental essays that are, you know, just highly experimental that have never been done before. Um, there's a great report from, I think it was um, a Beaver Gebs lab. The first time they were trying to engineer the drop seek instrumentation where they were doing these so-called barnyard experiments where they're spiking in human cells and mice cells. So you could like very cal uh, carefully calibrate the pumps and the microfluidics so that you could do single cell sequencing for the very first time. And um, of course, that's a scientific endeavor in itself to optimize it and set it up and get it going. And I think we're, we're kind of in this um, similar era right now for within NCPI, because there's just not a lot of information, because all the whittles are brand new, all the workflows are brand new. We're in this like highly experimental phase where, you know, there's with a few notable exceptions, I think, you know, things like a, a regular bread and butter GATK run is pretty well understood, but a lot of other things are not. Um, I think the most practical approach forward is sort of moving into this consumable model where for kind of popular workflows, maybe we're not gonna get 100% reliability on estimating costs, but if we can get like, I don't know, 90% confidence interval, I think that would be a huge win. Um, that's sort of the gap right now that we really need to focus on. So what are some actual next steps? Uh, and this is gonna come both at a technical level and sort of an outreach uh, level. Um, different uh, cloud platforms have in various stages, you know, various templates, guides, Let's, let's uh, really endorse that. And furthermore, um, I think it would be a great benefit to the researcher community if we could you know, have standardized language, standardized budget justifications that would be endorsed by NCPI. Just this morning, I was contacted by a researcher that is planning to submit an R1 and they need help with this. And you know, they're looking for letters of support. You know, I'm happy to work you know, and do that, but wouldn't it be just great if we could say, oh yeah, this is the things you need to do. It's endorsed by all of NCPI. You know, it's a well understood process. I think that would really um, help. Uh, you know, basically every researcher that's interested to do this. Another thing that we're, we're doing. You know, all the platforms have some information about logging in and doing analysis and thinking through the issues. But I think it would help to have like a few um, sort of end to end case studies that really thinks about the entire life cycle of what's really of the of the both the complexity and also some of the advantages, right? So what does it really take to get your account set up, including billing accounts? What does it really take to sort of get the data that you need in place, either uploading or getting access? What does it really take to do kind of the, you know, the batch computing? What does it take to do the uh, interactive computing? What does it take to egress? What does it take to distribute? What does it take to maintain this over time as issues are pointed out or new ideas come? You know, I think we need a few of these like case studies written up um, and I know of a few that are kind of really percolating. We, and at this meeting, we've heard about a few. So let's get those written up. Um, I think that would be just really informative um, for everyone just to kind of see what's there. Again, it'll, it'll be, I think it needs to be balanced about here's the amazing science that was possible because of this. And also, you know, here are some real considerations that you need to be planning for. And then another kind of um, activity was uh, there seems to be a grassroots effort or in some cases a, a funded effort to, to sort of um, uh, have this sort of phase one of this consumable model where we're recording, you know, what are the costs, what are the computing um, uh, requirements, time, resources, and so forth for different workflows. It's a little bit um, grassroots right now in the sense that the efforts are independent, but we all kind of mutually agree it would be great to unify this in some way. Here I'm calling it a database 
Although I think for this first phase, it's just sort of collecting raw numbers and basically a spreadsheet. Um, and then you know, from that, we can see how comparable things are across platforms, across instance types, across workflows. Um, in the case of Anvil, we're trying to do this based on say usage at Galaxy. And I think that's a pretty good uh, starting point, but you know, some of the data types that people are gonna be interested in especially as you get more into the um, healthcare, some of the firework we're talking about. And the here and now is not really well represented in Galaxy. So I think we need to be broader than that. Let's unify this into some database. I think those are achievable, you know, on a six month horizon. We also had some ideas, you know, kind of longer term, you know, is there some way that sort of NCPI can offer or support or help, you know, basically a free tier. And what I'm thinking about, like in Google, there's something called the CoLab where you just sort of sign in and then you immediately get access to Jupyter Notebooks and a terminal if you want it. These are not high-end machines. They're like two core machines, but wow, it's transformative for students and analysts that just like want to get in and not have to deal with, you know, all the complexity of billing accounts and so forth. If we could figure out some strategy to get that, that would be, I think that would be really transformative to getting people on. I know we offer credits, but again, those credits come with administrative overhead um, so that um, they just may not be compelling enough. Another thing we talked about, and this is something I'd be interested to do, but I would, I would really strongly prefer to do it in person, would be to have like a codeathon where you could look at popular workflows, really sort of um, sort of focus on how to optimize them. Um, there, there are often scenarios where you know there's overhead as associated with booting up a virtual machine. Um, at the same time, you know, a very high memory virtual machine is gonna be way more expensive than a low memory um, uh, virtual machine. So by sort of optimizing what work is done on what virtual machine and, and, and other, you know, GPUs or whatnot, there's often some engineering work that can be done to optimize that beyond just like a very straightforward implementation. So I'd love to kind of organize some sort of codeathon, just get the, to get the community uh, more and more interested in this. Um, in years past, I've done this where we've offered like nominal prizes. And I think that's like a really um, a great, wire, great way to inspire people. You know, just, you know, things like, you know, iPad level prizes, not, you know, not Nobel prizes, but nevertheless, that's a great inspiration for students and analysts that are uh, working towards this. You know, and then a, another longer term activity is, you know, I, I don't know what the right mechanism is, but supplemental funding or, maybe dedicated R1s or other sorts of awards, you know, get, just get more and more people on board. In the case of Anvil, we do have this AC2, this Anvil Cloud Credits uh, program that is getting started to do this, but I think this is just the very beginning um, to address these sorts of issues. So uh, happy to take a few questions, but you know, obviously these are gonna be um, with us for a long time. Thanks for that, Michael. That was super helpful. And I know I've been trying to monitor Slack in the chat. So I know there are folks who have have some questions for you. Stan, Stan did you want to jump in? <laughs> I always want to jump in. So I completely agree, Michael, that this is a, a big social change and we need to help people through it. And I would say that cloud costs are the huge large number of questions that we get in Biodata Catalyst with our users. And we don't have very good answers. I mean, we send them to people who might have better answers, but we don't have any great answers to, to yeah. provide. Um, I like the ideas that you're putting forward. I think we need to make sure when we wrap up after this meeting that we emphasize that we have to do more work in this space. There is some more work being funded, but it's at fairly modest levels. But we're going to need some creativity and this idea of, of providing people with workspaces that they could use to dabble in this space might be something, you know, you know and the competitive idea that you had of doing it as a competition might be a way that we could get, get ourselves kick-started. Yeah. So I, I, I think there is so much stuff here to chew on and the transition to the cloud won't be a success until we figure out this component, th this aspect of, of this program. I completely agree. And, and there's a spectrum. I think for certain runs, cloud is just so obviously the right thing to do, especially if you're doing, you know, very, very large compute. But, you know, there's only so many projects of that type per year. 
And I think our outreach, our mission is much broader than that. I mean, we want to support all researchers all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think as, as you kind of go down the continuum from these mega projects to more modest size to, you know, individual students, you know, trying to get started, I think we have to speak to all these different levels if, if we're going to be really successful here. Totally agree. I'll yeah, let others I, ask questions. Well, I just want to comment, Michael. I love the idea that you sort of uh, reflected back in the break, uh, in the report out of, you know, I know there's so many of these conversations going on within the individual projects that participate in NCPI, but bringing it up to an NCPI level and saying, what could we do collaboratively together? Yeah. Um, I think is a really important point. Um, ben, I saw that you had a comment in the in the chat. Do you want to kind of verbally chime in? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can elaborate a little bit. I, you know, I'm aware that there's a lot of broader efforts around building cloud infrastructure and compute resources. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of people who do environmental research or applied physics and work with big data and have cataloging efforts. And I know there's there's federal efforts on open access. And, and I I was excited that, that Mike's bringing up Google Lab and, and, and these commercial products that support broader efforts. And I, I just, the, the combination of those thoughts made me excited about NCPI being a place for ensuring that our internal NIH focused and intra-institute uh, interoperability can align with these broader currents across the federal government or other outside resources as well. So, so just that idea of, of having this be a forum where we can make sure we're aligning and we're not reinventing wheels again and again, but, but leveraging tools that, that many people are working on in a lot of different contexts. I just wanted to add, uh, and, and uh, Mike, I thought the session yesterday was great. Um, and uh, I had to step away from a second, so you might have said this, but one of the things that I really was excited about the ideas around the free tier setting, um, really related to the notion of um, linking free tier to you know highly standardized um, or well-established, as I think Mike, you're describing here, like non-experimental settings in ways that users by using them actually create shareable data products that are immediately interoperable. Um, and so you, by providing that free tier layer, you're also essentially subsidizing downstream data products, you know, from a particular user's own data in ways that's immediately harmonized or interoperable with other NIH supported data sets. Um, so, you, so, so, so in some respects, um, while you're supporting that user's research, you're also creating broader data sets that are already harmonized or pre-configured for um, analysis uh, as, you know, by community uh, members already in the cloud that can be shared. So you're sort of feed forward, future-proofing data sets that users themselves are generating uh, through that structure. And you might have already described this, Mike, I just thought that was a really exciting notion. Well, I think, I think um, I, so I fully agree with you. I think that there will be a part of research and probably that will be very popular, right? If you had a free tier where you could do, I don't know, some set of exomes for free, I think that would be a super popular option. In addition to that though, I do wanna kind of give, um, you know, kind of full access where, especially for getting kind of new analysts, new researchers, right. you know, let's drop them in, a, you know, our studio environment, let's drop them in a Jupyter notebook. And that's sort of what CoLab has today, but, and there are ways where, you know, you can kind of behind the scenes tie it to, um, um, you know, one of our platforms here, but wow, wouldn't it be so much more efficient if they could kind of get into a free tier um, Jupyter notebook where it was already initialized with all the right sort of, you know, um, uh, NCPI packages, uh, Anvil packages, Biodata Catalyst packages, you know, just ready to go. Um, I, I think that would be really transformative to helping people get on and, and getting um, some exposure to this. That's great. I, I'm actually just wondering, because we do have, we do have a little bit of time, if any of our NIH uh, program staff want to uh, comment on this idea, which I think has so many, um, has gotten a lot of people excited. I mean, I'll chime in. I, I mean, I like the idea. I mean, you know, as you know, I mean, 
it's not just the established institutions um, that have you know, significant funding that are having trouble transitioning to this environment, but it's also those institutions that are resource limited um, that we're trying to also reach. And I think this also could be helpful for them to even become aware that this resource exists and how to use this resource. So I think it's a win-win to go both the, with this. Um, but you're right, it's gonna take some level of coordination across the NH to make sure this is done in a meaningful way. But I like the idea. That's great. Any other NIH comments before I hand it to Stan? I, I just wanted realize... to follow up on, Ken, on, on Ken's comment, if I, if I might. Oh, sure. I was just going to say, uh, and good, I see Valentina's hand raised. I realize when we talk about free, what we really mean is NIH for this. So that, that's why sort of seeking additional comments. But Stan, go ahead and then we'll hand it to Valentina. So Ken, I, I kind of didn't pay enough attention when you first started talking. That's my totally my bad. So did was your point that they're internally getting people to make the shift to using it, to, to using the cloud has been challenging? That, I'm asking because we're seeing similar types of hesitancies at, at the at the university level i mean i think that I, I think there is and i think this for varying reasons a lot of them is what mike has highlighted in, in the discussions that he's given i mean there's some institutions that you know just like i said they're comfortable with their local systems and you know they're everything's set to go and you know there there's from their perspective there's no need for them to transition over but then there's this other group of institutions and that just don't have the infrastructure to do genomic, large scale genomic research that are really being left in, left behind. Um, and just concepts such as using a credit card period is like an, an, a heavy load for those institutions to be able to even utilize, which is necessary for a cloud resource. And so providing incentives and encouragement and where we can training and understand, maybe like Mike said, some already established pipelines and workflows that they can already just use to get familiar with and you know would be helpful because you're seeing, at least what I'm seeing, and maybe I'm the only one seeing it, but I doubt I am, um, that there are various barriers that need to be, that we're experiencing as far as that preventing, you know, the broad range of groups from transitioning over uh, to the cloud. Some of it is political, some of it is cultural, and some of it is just, just infrastructure and, 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 and uh, technical capabilities. And they all have to be addressed in some shape, form, or fashion. And how to prioritize is part of the struggle. But I, that's why I kind of like Mike's ideas. Like, you know, I thought that's a way to kind of, one, get incentives for all these different groups that have these different barriers to come in and just understand how this resource could be useful. And then also help us tease out what are some of the things we can do both at the extramural and the NH level to try to address some of these barriers that, you know, such as like, you know, can we come up with more novel ways to pay for these resources other than a credit card? You know? Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense, Stan. It's, you know, it's much you are. <laughs> you are. And, and a lot of what you're saying resonates with me because we, we want to be able to provide students both at our institution and in other institutions that we work with, with resources to use in the cloud, because they can't set them up by themselves in many cases. Uh, it, it, even at the at the university level, it, it democratizes the ability to do larger and more difficult um, types of, uh, of uh, computational tasks in, in, in classrooms. And so all of these issues that you're bringing up, I had not thought about the fact that there's this analogy happening inside of probably companies and the federal agencies. So we're all seeing the same set of challenges that we need to overcome. Yeah. So thank you, that was really good observation. Valentina, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I, so I just wanted to say that this is a, a topic of intense discussions within NGRI. Um, so a couple of things, I mean, we had also discussions with our council members recently on this topic, and there were a couple of things that they pointed out. One is, um, why, why do you need to, so, so the key question is how to bring genomic data science uh, and have undergraduates, you know, approach genomic data science and, and learn, right? So that's the question. How can we target that population? 
Um, so one key uh, issues that were raised by, by our council members uh, um, is that do you really need the club, right? Um, <laughs> for do that. I mean, the argument for some of them was like, what, what they need really is, you know, good data sets, basic background of statistics, uh, <laughs> basic computing skills, and that you can do on a single server. You do not need a cloud to do that, right? So, so, um, and, and there was, you know, a lot of discussion about all, all this point. So this is something for us to think about is, is really, if we're really serious about teaching undergrads how to do genome data science, um, are, are these, you, these resources really essential? The NCPI concept is that really essential for reaching out to this type of communities. And then the other topic that was raised is what I already mentioned, which is, um, to, to generate a genomic data scientist, you need so much background in biology, genomics, computing, and so on, statistics, <laughs> that um, it's not clear that the infrastructure, the, the, yeah, the teaching infrastructure in some of these co uh, colleges and communities is in place to learn and to teach all of this. Um, so, so, it's unclear where the students are that could really learn to do this. Um, so I, I just wanted to share this with you. That to me, those discussions were with our council members were quite illuminating. That's all. No, thanks for that, Valentina. I think that's so important um, and certainly a, a really valuable perspective. James, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that, I mean, I really like this idea. I'm not sure how mechanistically NIH can manage it, but we can we can put our heads together and think about that. Because I've seen examples of uh, investigators who, you know, went to NIH study sections with proposals for analysis uh, grants that basically, you know, fell flat because, gee, you haven't already done it, so therefore we don't know if you can do it. Um, even though they had a they had bioinformatics background, it was that particular analysis. Gee, it might not show anything imp important. And we have such a conservative review venue that venues that it's it's very difficult to get the resources you need. And so this investigator did some really spectacular work, downloading to his institutional servers, which were you know, something provided to a resource provided to him by his institution. And that kept him away from doing possibly an even bigger project that was more impactful on the cloud. And we need to basically be able to empower people to not only the grad student who you want to sit down in your lab because you don't know the bioinformatics, but you know that bright grad student could learn if they had the resources but you want to have pilot projects that people can do to demonstrate feasibility so that they can then get the, the grant support to, to, to uh, enable them to pull out a credit card and, and do whatever they need um, in the cloud. So, you know, uh, this is a, a difficult chicken and egg problem, but I think, I think the idea of having some easy to access, um, free as it were, um, cloud spaces that people can play in and maybe do some, some sort of standard analysis is really an outstanding idea. Anyway. That's, that's great, thank you for that. It's, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, Michael, it sounds validating to me having just been in your breakout to hear so much support for this idea. It's a complex topic. Um, and I, I think, you know, Valentina's point about, um, you know, who is our real target audience? Is it every single undergraduate needs to know this? But, you know, I, I, I think that's a really appropriate. And also, you know, there is obviously a lot you can do on your laptop. And, you know, we should take advantage of it. But at some point, you know, the research is going to outgrow your laptop, is going to outgrow what you can do. So there needs to be at least some pathways for, 
and maybe not everyone, but there needs to be some pathway for advanced students to, to get exposure to these technologies. Um, I think we all agree that we want our high powered graduate students to know about them, but high powered graduate students start out as high powered undergraduate students. So we just gotta, we gotta feed this pipeline. That's great. I think we're gonna leave that as the last word, Michael. Stans and Ken, I'm sorry to cut you guys off. If you wanna put your comments in the chat, they'll be recorded and others can respond. I do, um, it's important, we have two more breakouts. I wanna be sure we enable time for that. So next up is search, Dave Ro Ro uh, Rogers. I'm sorry, Dave, to do that to you. All right. <laughs> Wondering who I am myself sometimes. Uh, let's see. All right, so we had a great, uh, uh, a great session, and uh, uh, when we were setting, when I was setting it up, I wanted a way to, a way to hear from, uh, you know, everyone, and set, and set up a structure, uh, a, a structure of the conversation as we hadn't met, you know, as this group before, and we don't, as I mentioned, we don't have a, a, a you know, an ongoing search. Uh, ongoing search group. And um, so we set up an easy retro board and we had four columns in it. And we said, uh, uh, what are some uh, user impediments for finding uh, usable data sets across platforms? So, you know, uh, uh, data set search or study search. And then what are uh, key user impediments for creating cohorts across uh, platforms? So, you know, cohort creation. And then uh, what activities should we undertake in the next six months to uh, discover or, and address the user pain points uh, related to search? And then, uh, and then if should we organize and, and, and how should we organize? Because there are a couple of options to run it up. And, um, and then, uh, so the outcome of this was, was uh, and you, you mentioned that's, that, uh, you know, use cases and, uh, are, are um, you know, a theme and we're joining that theme. So uh, the outcome is, uh, you know, very much, you know, what is it that exactly that we're trying to do and how can we validate who is trying to do this and um, to uh, reach out to users and to, to validate this and then to document it and, and, and use it to inform our, our roadmap. So we said, what are the gaps in, um, in finding studies? And uh, these are, oh, I guess my updates are not in here. So, so the, the, um, the gaps in finding studies uh, and these are in priority order are, uh, uh, is interesting how understanding uh, how the data is consented and how to apply for access. So that was, uh, you know, the most votes. And then uh, the rest of it is a kind of a, um, you know, salad of searching over all the things you might want to search over to find uh, a study. So, you know, does the study contain the phenotype I'm interested in? Was it, was, was the data created in a way that I can use it with experimental, you know, experimental data, metadata? Does it have the, uh, you know, subject with the kind of demographics that I'm interested in? And then, uh, the, you know, the genotype search, or is it, does the variant or uh, exist in the, um, in the study that I'm uh, interested in. And then finding this out obviously before I have uh, access. So to motivate uh, um, motivate applying for access. And then in the cohort building, again, in, in priority order, um, this is farther away because, oh, thank you. This is uh, farther away because uh, I, I, I think the team felt that, you know, it's difficult um, at this point to come up with, uh, you know, uh, like a an integrated search strategy, a strategy, you know, a grand vision. You know, there's no grand vision coming out of this uh, about how to integrate search across all the platforms. But we we felt that um, um, just even finding and gaining access to the different search portals was was challenging. So Brian talking about single single sign on, and we're talking about well, where where is where is the link to the, the to the portal, and uh, and um, and then uh, once you do build a cohort, then how how do you and how can we make it very easy to send your cohort to the workspace of your choice? So, uh, uh, and there's a, this you know trend of having this nice juicy button export cohort to workspace. And so we wanted to um, just it was thought that you know that the lack of, of, of the ubiquity of those buttons is um, is a is a key uh, gap. And then so. Uh, in terms of next steps, this is you know limited to stuff that we felt we could accomplish, in, uh, you know, in the near term and then in the next six months. Uh, uh, and basically, it's it's to form. I think uh, it was pretty much well. The group felt that there, a search working group need to be needed to be um, uh, needed to be developed. I don't know what necessarily what the mechanics are of that, but we can you know discuss that you know after. And then the, the activities that this group would, would undertake would, would be to conduct UX research and um, to determine 
uh, and, and use the research that's already been, that's already out there. I know there's there's plenty of research, and each platform has done individual research. So collect the research that's already been done, but then reach out reach out to um, to users to determine um, specifically for this cross platform use case uh, uh, what it is that 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 they're trying to do, and may provide some leadership about what it is that that, that we think they should be trying to do. And then uh, when doing user research, it's always difficult to find users, and so uh, you know we would have to figure out how to get users. And we, you know, the the, the, the BDC fellows came up. Uh, maybe we could um, maybe we could use use them. And there's um, yeah, I'll leave that there. Let's see. And then uh, even uh, to address the uh, where are the search uh, platforms and create a list of the search components and APIs used and put that on the um, on the NCPI site and along with a documentation about how to use each piece. Maybe we could uh, either at least link to do documentation uh, of, that's already exists about how to use each piece and maybe um, localize some of it. And then set up a, a way to collect feedback so we know if somebody's having trouble uh, using, um, finding or using or understanding uh, uh, understanding this list. And then uh, we also felt that uh, it would be useful to create, to, to, to inform a roadmap of, uh, uh, a, a longer term roadmap of uh, integrating uh, search together, that there's different types of search and different approaches to search. And so it would be interesting to create a search taxonomy to define uh, the different kinds of searches used and, and, and envisioned, uh, again, to inform the, the, the roadmap. And then um, one uh, hopefully easy use case is to, is, a thing we could do is to link back to the studies in context from the NCPI data set catalog. So right now, if you, you found the study, the study is interesting, uh, how can I get right back to Gen 3, uh, assuming that Gen 3 has an open access view of this study, maybe they expose more, more of the uh, public aggregates of this study or, or other, other context, uh, how can I get from uh, um, discovery of the study to view of the study in the um, platform where it's native, where it, it, it's been in, in, ingested, how can I do that? And so we'll be reaching out to each of the platforms to, um, to search platforms to see if we can if we can do that. And then uh, it was brought up in the Slack and also in the meeting that there's this upcoming search RFI uh, um, and that we should um, prepare, uh, the working group could, uh, and individuals could prepare uh, some feedback for that. And then, uh, you know, since our number one, um, our number one uh, gap on finding studies was uh, explaining the data consents, I think we could, we could there is documentation, obviously, on dbGaP about what the data consents mean, but we could highlight that or uh, provide a simplified uh, version uh, overview of that on the on the portal. Um, it's a, a kind of a reasonably low lift effort, and then um, of course, uh, with I think this is for me, uh, and, I, and I hope probably for a lot of people, this has been a great uh, uh, kind of understanding of what fire is and how it relates to the general search. I think for me, the understanding of the, the implementation guides that the fire has now a data model, uh, can enforce the data models that it's been forced in, not forced, but uh, required for the, um, for the um, medical uh, community, uh, for, the, for the collection of, of records, that's very important. And also to get out the, the concept that, well, you don't, the fire does have search, but it, you don't have to, it, you can build your own index, just pull the data in and index it yourself. Like, like folks said, that if you need a specific type of search, uh, index it yourself in your Elasticsearch or whatever you want and, um, and so on. So I think those are things that a, a, a FIRE working group uh, could work on. And yeah, that's our, our readout. Thanks for that, Dave. Does anybody have questions or comments? I can't believe we're having a search conversation and nobody's jumping in. <laughs> okay, Sam. You're muted again, Stan. I'm glad I was muted. I'm beginning to realize that I need to stop talking so much. That probably realization should have occurred many, many months ago. So I thought this was a really, really stimulating discussion, and I appreciated the way you organized it, Dave. The, um, I did wonder if we need a deeper discussion about not just the searches that we're used to. And part of my motivation is that I'm on a, a working group that's trying to plan a, a workshop on search. 
and what's emerging is a clear realization that there's probably going to be a lot of different searches and we need to, to carefully um, describe when you might want to use one versus the other. And, and I think there's more than just cohort building and, and study location. I think there's a bunch of different um, places where search is going to play a, a much deeper role in creating our opportunities to do science. So I was hoping maybe a little bit of discussion on that topic. So I'll put down my hand and see if anybody responds. Steve, I'm channeling you and I'm wondering if you wanna go ahead and chime in and it, if that might sort of help address part of Stan's question. That is, uh, you know, preaching to the choir. I, I love that idea. I think anything that we can do to nail down uh, what the pieces are and how they differ from each other is just gonna, enhance the meaning of the word search when we use it. It's not a big undifferentiated space, right? There are a lot of different specific things that we search for and user needs uh, of that nature. So I'll just sort of dovetail that into the, the thing that I wanted to say, which is in the breakout, we talked about, you know, it, it's apple pie that we need to talk to users. So we talked about the fellows like Dave mentioned, and if other folks have uh, ideas about the kind of user who is, you know, thoughtful and expressive about their search use cases, uh, we are, you know, interested in hearing about those folks. So, just wanted to throw that open to to this larger group. Um, I I I think when, when we're talking about yes, these these finding studies and building cohorts, that, that's all very interesting. But but back to the back to the previous conversation about cloud cloud costs then being able to index and build upon that derived results, uh, you know, sounds, you know, pretty interesting in terms of, you know, another category or, or way of searching as every analysis that's done then provides something that could be, um, you know, indexed and, uh, and, and, and built upon, like, you know, using the GitHub analogy, every, you know, GitHub packages use GitHub packages and, uh, and you build this, you know, giant ecosystem of code. And so, uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a, an area that would be interesting to explore as, as well. Yeah, and to that point, Dave, I just wanna bring up, I guess, because this has been something I've been thinking about recently is because uh, with dbGaP and NCBI now sort of becoming a formal part of NCPI, I'm sort of wondering, you know, what opportunities or what can we leverage from their decades of work basically helping researchers find resources i mean in so many ways at least as a user that's been my experience as, as something they do incredibly well and have a lot of expertise doing so um kind of building in uh the ncbi experience and acknowledging, you know, what could be done to leverage what tools they have um, in terms of referencing back and forth between our projects, I think is is a future opportunity that yeah. we can really capitalize on. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we're, we're, we're I think we're the original user of the of the of the uh, DBGAP Fire API. Uh, so uh, so hopefully we're uh, we're in there. Um, and as they add information to that API. Um, uh, I think we'll we'll certainly be able to use it. But yes, yes, and yeah, it's very cool to see that Fire made it onto our our readout here. I think that when we assemble this group, there's a whole conversation to be had about uh, metadata and curation because, of course, search is going to be much more rich and informed. We're going to have access to implementing the use cases that people need to see if we do use Fire. In my opinion but also go beyond just Fire, which is a file format to really address the content, right? What is the semantic content that we're expressing within Fire and how is it interoperable, semantically interoperable? Like are people using identifiers that we know anything about, for example? Yeah, I think yeah. it's nice because we're free to use identifiers that are universal as well as define our own for some of those standards. And we definitely hit that on like the summary pieces from a data dictionary, right? That's one of the things of, uh, do we just pick some, <laughs> right? Is there an NCPI summary? Like, is that the term that we want to use? Yeah, I mean, I what mean, we're seeing in other projects is, <clears throat> you know, this, the ideas that we come up with in this space place a burden on curators, right? So it, it's a fairly complicated process to uh, select the right vocabularies, ontologies, things like that. 
and and explain them to curators in a way that that makes it accessible for them to actually produce these artifacts. Yes. So, I'm sorry, I stepped on somebody. All right, Stan, go so, ahead, and then we'll leave it to Robert for the last comment. Perfect. So, Robert, what I was hoping that we might see, if we're going to use fire or other possible um, standards like that in the search uh, universe, it's really exciting to me to be able to instrument what we're finding as a consequence of the metadata and be able to perhaps even define some standards that are driven by use and not necessarily by the genius of the people who made up the the, the hierarchy or the or the metadata models. Now, I don't know if that's possible, but it seems to me like it would be a logical thing to attempt to do. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, I don't know, it's interesting. It's complicated quickly. I think you're right about the use. And I guess this is what we're, we're Steve, talking about, like that question of, forcing people to use particular things in some regards you know it's once again like where is is the complaint are we going to require that those um, curators actually solve those problems of complexity or are we going to allow them to be flexible in what they're providing and then like shut and having to deal with some of that uh, on the top end and providing the services to actually index across the different source vocabularies I think that's that's the architecture question and that's right. You know, where the funding comes in and that's where we, we really yeah how useful can it be if everybody's using their own vocabularies but how is it impossible but, to get everyone to right. agree on the front end but, but and it, so go ahead dave i would say it varies over the maturity of the assay right so in the beginning when the assay is new or in like single cell space where you know all kinds of stuff's happening then uh then you, maybe you don't know exactly what metadata fields you need to be and what you should call them and which ontology you should you should use. But as a, as it matures, then I think you can start to say, hey, if you want to submit to this repository, you need to conform, you, you know, and use the standards based approach. You must have these fields; they must be sourced from these ontologies. And then uh, you know, and then it's nice to have. You should have these if you want to be in our repository. And I. I see that happening, you know, and leaders in a single cell space, and it'd be great if that could happen here. And then we had a strategy where, hey, in the early days, you know, it's a, it's a wild west. And later on, hey, everybody knows how to do this. Call it what everybody else calls it and, and let's move on, right? I think that nails it. It's incumbent on us to at least have that strategy because a lot of folks really just want some guidance, right? What should we use is a big right. question. Yeah, I think, Steve, we're going to leave that in, as the last word. So, so thank you. I think that was a very important discussion. Um, I love that we ended, ended on semantic maturity. So um, we're going to hand it to Stan, who's going to do a report back on the other interop uh, discussion in the breakout. So um, this is likely to be less of um, a frenzied discussion than the prior topics, plural. But we did have a re very interesting discussion, and I will speak philosophically toward the end of this. So we identified the gaps and key blockers for creating interoperability, and those were that we really need to understand some clear, defined use cases from real-world applications to, so that we know where to go to further explore making our ecosystem, and in this case, let's just constrain ourselves to the NCPI club, if you will, um, to, to figure out where we need to go next. Um, interestingly enough, I think there's significant demand out there. We're hearing that you know people are all frequently asking to be able to use data that is found in multiple platforms. So this is something that two years ago might not have been imaginable, and now we're shifting to where people are expecting it and wanting it. So of course, that means that just as per the prior discussion, that means searching across platforms is essential. And luckily we're making some progress in that space as well. So I think that the stars are aligning that we're beginning to see the use cases emerge and that, that we're going to be able to increasingly help researchers do things that they could not have even imagined, did not have the imagination, if you will, in the past. Then we also discuss what the actionable next steps are in the next six months, including the potential driving use cases. So again, 
we've got to seek out actively, not passively, the real world researchers that want to be able to do this. And maybe it's the next gen generation of users who want and can see the use utility of interoperability features. We absolutely came down as a group, um, at least in my opinion, that we need to be able to standardize how tools and apps are deployed across the ecosystem so that we can, um, for whatever reason, run the apps that we want in order to achieve the uh, computational goals that are designed, whether it's on platform A or platform B, et cetera. We need to be able to develop um, clear methods for publishing completed use cases so that we can replicate them, not replicate them just to be able to do verification and reproducibility. Of course, that's really handy, but also we can use them for training purposes. So if we build this ecosystem in a reasonable way and reasonably quickly, we can take advantage of this great upswell in the interest that students have. And believe me, I'm seeing it on my campus. My classes in data science, particularly when I talk about health science topics, are packed. And so um, why not think about putting YouTube videos out there in order to understand and explain to people how we can do things differently than we've done them in the past. And then finally, uh, look for opportunities to actively do training in this space. And I think that's come up a number of times in different um, groups in the last however many hours it is we've met in the last two days. But um, the idea of being able to give people examples of what might be possible, both to train them, but also to stimulate their thinking or their scientific boundaries expand, I think is essential. And now I'll just wax um, philosophical for a few minutes because we have just a few minutes for me to potentially burn. Um, what we're thinking about here is a new computing paradigm, and it's not a surprise that it's coming along. We're kind of building up the hierarchical stack of what we can do in terms of computation and geography and function. And so, you know, we're, we're at a brave new world where we can assemble bits and pieces from different collections of capabilities and put them together to be able to achieve scientific objectives that we didn't think about in the past. So the fact that this is hard and it's clumsy and it's taking us time, we somehow need to convey to leadership. And when I say leadership, I don't mean just NIH who happens to be a large funder in this space, but I'm talking about leadership at the national level and at the university level, that this is really important work and it's not just gonna affect um, to life sciences. It's going to affect how we do work in all of the sciences. And so it's a national imperative that we think about how we put these pieces on together in, in and in in it's going to take many villages to be able to get this right. And with that, I'll, I'll rest. Okay, comments. We have just a few minutes left before we're going to transition to the next session. Valerie, thank you. I'm trying to get better about raising my hand. Um, yeah, I think we also, um, you know, Stan ended up in this discussion about, you know, the value of having multiple portals versus central, central everything, try to boil the ocean portals. Um, and, and that's where we also got into this theme of like, what we're doing in NCPI, which is exposing data through APIs in a standard way so that multiple tools and portals, you know, and applications can be built on top of the same source of data. Um, but, you know, I think we, we hear from our communities that these sort of, uh, you know, portals that are designed for certain communities are really valuable, but, um, you know, we already talked about the value of having the ability to search across the environments as well. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Valerie. Brian? Hey, um so Stan, I just wanted to kind of plus one your idea here of, of, of publishing, right? So, uh, you know, I, I think we have a lot of use cases, um, many of which are active, which is great. And we're gonna hear more about use cases a little bit later. Um, but I, I like the idea of, you know, publishing beyond just the white paper or the paper that goes to a journal or whatever, um, but turning these into like tutorials. And I think, both like the Terra platform and Seven Bridges platform have the concept of kind of, I think they call them by different names, but like featured workspaces where you can take your working environment that you worked in and essentially publish it. 
And I think that would be a really nice artifact um, to publish out to the community to say, you know, these use cases that have been going through NCPI that people have written papers on, uh, also you can, you can clone their, their workspace and see exactly how they did their analysis. Something like that I think would be very, very powerful um, and something that would be a relatively minor lift from people that are already working in these systems. Um, I don't wanna add a bunch of work on top of writing a paper, um, but this I think would add a lot of value. No, and Stan put it in the chat, I think executable papers. So great idea and great point. David? Yeah, piggybacking on Brian, um, ISPCGC, one of the NCP or CRDC cloud resources is actually getting curricula now to work on the derived data and the interactive stuff using our um, notebooks, Python notebooks, teaching courses that way. So, you know, very much along the line of interactivity where you can do billions of calculations with big query finding statistically relevant correlations for in a couple hours for less than a, a $2 cost, really bringing that to the end users and using tools that they're already familiar with, so. Thank you for that comment, that's great. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time for this session. So I think I just wanna say in closing, we've had a lot of phenomenal discussions. I think uh, all the breakout groups really made some progress and, and this has been a valuable touch point for us to check in across our various projects on these efforts that are ongoing. But I do just wanna reflect um, listening to these report backs, I'm just reminded that we have to uh, acknowledge, I think, that while we are all technologists or, or, or data folks at some level, what we're talking about here is really people issues in so many uh, ways over and above and underlying the technology. So sort of this issue around communities and also making cultural change, I think is one that we need to reflect on and carry through for the rest of the day. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Brian, who's going to talk uh, about uh, our kind of interest and relationship with GA4GH, another community effort. Great, thank you. You can move to the next slide. All right, so um, I think most folks on this call uh, are familiar with GA4GH or have heard of it, kind of mentioned in passing as we're talking about things like DERS and, and other sort of standards uh, that we already use. Um, but just to take a step back, um, you know, the, the mission of GA4GH, uh, which stands for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, is to enable genomic data sharing uh, for the benefit of human health, right? So a very uh, high level mission there. Um, GA4GH, it's a policy framing and a technical standard setting um, organization. Uh, and it's really, for me personally, I'm, I'm very much involved in the technical standard setting side. And I think we've definitely leaned into that aspect of GA4GH and NCPI. Um, some of the standards that I'll talk about coming up and potential standards that maybe we'll use in the future definitely fit uh, particular sort of use cases and needs that we've identified for interoperability between our systems. So the GA4GH I think has been uh, quite useful uh, for NCPI in, in terms of uh, establishing technical standards um, that we could then leverage for interoperability. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. And I, I will say too that I'll, I'll try and make these, these slides kind of somewhat interactive too. So there'll, there'll be a few points where I kind of call out to the, the group and, and wanna get feedback along the way. So I just don't want this to be just a one-way uh, presentation on GA4GH. I want it to be more of a conversation. Um, but again, more background on the organization. Uh, this slide's a little bit dated, but you're looking at a very international organization. You've got 90 plus countries represented. You've got over 600 organizational members and then individuals. Uh, you're looking at over 3,000. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how GA4GH itself works. Um, so it's organized into essentially four different um, branches or, or efforts. Uh, the first two, I think, are, are the most impactful for us in NCPI, or at least the uh, parts of GA4GH that we're going to be interacting with the most day-to-day. -day. 
and that is the, the work streams. And the work streams are basically, think of them as technical working groups that look at things like cloud API standards um, uh, or uh, data search and discovery or uh, researcher identity. So these are individual work streams that are organized around a, a theme and are working on particular standards. And the work streams work very closely with driver projects. And so when um, an organization signs up to be a driver project, uh, they're saying that they have skin in the game, that they want to use GA4GH APIs, that they wanna contribute back feedback. They're gonna have staff on their, uh, on their side actively engaged with one or more work streams. Um, there's also a, a technical um, subcommittee that's working on infrastructure that makes it easier to publish um, standards and, and interact with the community. Um, and then I will point out like a fourth sort of pillar here is uh, partner engagement. So this is sort of outreach uh, to large organizations, national efforts um, uh, through the, the GA4GH uh, leadership. So if you could move to the next slide. Okay, so this just kind of dives into the, the sort of relationship between um, driver projects and the individual work streams. And it's very much a matrix relationship driven by the needs of the driver projects, right? So for a given driver project, they may be interested in large scale genomics, uh, cloud and genomic knowledge standards, for example, and may engage with those work streams, but not engage with others. And these sort of relationships change over time. Um, so next slide. Okay, I, I won't actually run through this video because it's like four minutes and I, I don't uh, think we have time for that, but this is a great little video. Um, you'll all get, I'm sure, copies of the slide pack for today. So feel free to take a look at this. It kind of walks over the general sort of vision of interoperability um, that is very applicable to NCPI from GA4GH. Uh, next slide. Oh, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> all right, so driver projects. Um, we're, we're, we already have skin in the game here. Um, as most of you know, like there are uh, <laughs> there are uh, APIs that we use, you know, on a daily basis that are really kind of the core of the data interoperability and sort of identity and authorization um, infrastructure. Um, but in terms of like us being uh, NCPI um, projects being drivers, um, there are already three efforts that are um, a part of the NCPI that are actually driver projects for GA4GH. And so that's NCI, CRDC, uh, NCI's GDC, and um, NHLBI's uh, top men. Um, this means that, you know, not only are we using these APIs, but this means that we have a seat at the table as driver projects, um, our needs and our, um, you know, wants and desires for these APIs really do get factored in uh, very closely. And we have things like, um, you know, moments in time where we will actually vote and ask driver projects to vote on changes. So really, it's it's really critical that that several of the NCPI um, efforts are drivers here because it gives us additional sort of um, uh, weight and say within the GA4GH since we are actively working with the uh, the work streams. So next slide. Okay, so what do we use today? So GA4GH super useful collection of API standards. Um, it's not everything, right? There's of course um, HL7, there's FHIR, there's, there are other standard groups that are, are obviously impactful and useful for NCPI, um, but GA4GH standards um, are already you know, used um, by NCPI and there are a few key ones. So passports and the authentication authorization infrastructure, uh, the idea of a passport broker, um, these are key concepts and key technologies that are part of the researcher auth system or RAS uh, coming out of NIH that we're all using and starting to use more in our systems. Um, the data repository service. This is how do I take an ID for a data object and then look it up and find out, oh, it's on Google Cloud here. Oh, it's on Amazon Cloud here. This is how I can use a passport to actually then get access to those, uh, those copies in the cloud. Um, that's what uh, DURS is providing. And I also, we don't talk about it a lot because I think a lot of our conversations, at least the ones that I'm a part of, are focused on passports and DURS and getting that working across all of our systems. 
Um, but we do behind the scenes use the tool registry service. Um, there's uh, the doc store platform, which advertises workflows and tools um, using Terse, and there's compatibility uh, with Terra based systems and Seven Bridges based systems to bring those workflows in over Terse. So we already have that um, kind of happening um, behind the scenes in the sense that we don't talk about it a lot with an NCPI, but it's certainly useful for all of our workspace environments to be able to pull in workflows that have been published over the Terse um, uh, uh, service. And then of course, again, something that we don't talk about a lot, but GA4GH is the home for things like the definition of CRAM and SAM and BAM and BCF and BCF. So there are various file format um, uh, working uh, groups within GA4GH that are maintaining those standards that of course, all of our pipelines and, and data repositories are using. Um, okay, if you could move to, uh, actually before you move here, um, if you, <laughs> thank you. Um, one thing I wanna call out as well is since the um, catalog of available standards are, you know, it's pretty big in GA4GH, I'm just kind of curious if there are other standards that folks within NCPI are actively using that maybe we haven't talked about coll uh, collectively as much, but I do want to kind of open up the um, the floodgates a little bit and ask the question from the various uh, teams on the call. Am I missing anything here, or are these the key ones that um, I know we've talked about, um, you know, quite a bit? But I'm I'm curious if there are any other key GA4GH APIs that folks on the call are leaning into with their respective projects. Okay. All right, so it sounds like I've, I've captured the big ones. Um, so if you could move on to the next slide. Okay, so what are some new opportunities here? Um, I think there, there are several, and I think NCPI as a group, you know, we have the freedom to choose what is useful to us, what helps. As Stan was saying, if we're framing our work around use cases and we're really focused on the use cases for the researchers, um, what is useful to them? How do we evolve our NCPI um, sort of vision of interoperability to include more functionality that supports those use cases? And so there are several that I think we should put on our radar as interesting, but um, you know, it's to be determined um, you know, whether or not they become on the critical path for um, NCPI over the next year. So I, I want to um, point out Data Connect is a recently published um, API from the discovery group. This is a search API. This is a fairly um, low barrier to entry table oriented, SQL sort of oriented search API uh, that we've been playing around with in various projects and it's very easy to deploy. Um, that might be very interesting technology to look at for quickly publishing um, search catalogs. So that's, that's one standard that we should look at uh, collectively. The other thing is data use ontology, Duo. Um, this is describing data use restrictions. We had this conversation earlier about um, sort of derived data and how do you like have the visas be uh, sticky and apply to workspaces and derived data. So this is part of the overall sort of ecosystem of describing what are you allowed to do with data, who's allowed to access it, and is worth looking into. Uh, Fino packets. Um, I'm probably not the a, a great expert here. I think there are other folks in the call that are much more familiar with Melissa Handel's work here and the team's work on Fino packets. Uh, it was a recently adopted uh, standard from GA4GH, and there's also bridge work happening there between Fino packets and the Fire uh, standard. So very, very interesting. I think this is something that uh, Robert Carroll and other folks in the call have probably already looked at or. Are, are interested in looking at it from the lens of the FIRE working group. Um, something that I'm interested in maybe for our next generation of uh, sort of distributed compute um, uh, is the task execution service TESS and the workflow execution service or WES. And so what we've done so far um, across the various NCPI systems is we focused really on the passport for giving the sort of identity and data access for a user and um, uh, Durst being able to provide data access in the sort of platform of your choice. Um, I'm really interested, and there may be other driver projects and use cases in the future that kind of demand this. I'm interested if, if we kind of invert that a bit and say, um, instead of pulling in the data on demand to the workspace environment that I'm, I'm working in, 
can we also have the model, maybe this is a, you know, an and thing and not an or thing of being able to send compute out to different locations for the work that we've done with an NCPI and the ISAs that we've signed and the agreements we've signed. We don't really need that. We have like this nice ecosystem where data can flow um, currently uh, between the, the authorized platforms. Um, but in the future, we may be in a larger ecosystem where there are certain data sets that can't flow beyond the boundary of their particular system. So this technology, these two standards from GA4GH may ultimately prove to be quite useful in that, um, in that area. Uh, the final one, it's more mundane, um, but at the end of the day, this is actually super useful for both us and the GA4GH. There's a service registry within the GA4GH that says, hey, if you've implemented this uh, standard, please let us know so others are aware of your implementation, others are aware of your service. And I already know, for example, the University of Chicago has registered their DERS implementations in this registry. So thank you for that. And this is a good practice for us to make our services discoverable to the larger community. Um, okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of API possibilities. There are many, many other APIs. Um, I encourage folks to take a look at that link embedded. I take a look at GA4GH.org because all of the APIs that are approved um, are described in, in great detail there. Again, I'm just kind of looking at the high level and have picked out some that I think are, are worthy of our working groups um, to look into in more details. There are other activities too that might be useful for us. Um, and that's the starter kit um, is a series of reference implementations. If people want to kick the tires on say Wes or Durs, it's easy to spin this up in the starter kit. So I would encourage folks to take a look at that. If you're considering say in the future, implementing a Durs server or implementing a Wes server, this is something that would be useful. Uh, to try it out. Um, I already mentioned previously the Technical Alignment Subcommittee, which is really geared towards build tools for documentation and other things that are super useful, but maybe uh, not, uh, uh, not worthy of kind of diving into too much detail um, in today's uh, uh, chat. And I think really beyond the APIs and the future APIs that we could be using, uh, for me, the, the final item here is the Federated Analysis Systems Project or FAST. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. I have a slide on, on FAST, um, but I, I had another sort of question for the group, which is I've talked a lot about like APIs that are coming from GA4GH, but GA4GH is a very friendly standards organization and we have several driver projects that are part of it. And so one of the things that driver projects do is also propose new um, standards. Uh, they see gaps and they are proposing uh, uh, to fill those gaps. So one thing that I've talked about with, you know, Bob Grossman, you know, previously is, is it time for PFB to be, you know, handed to discovery and maybe that becomes a GA4GH serialization standard or, you know, are there other um, conventions that we've been using within NCPI that we, th we think are valuable? and we want to have kind of rolled into a standard. So I wanna pause there for a second and get folks thoughts on, is there anything that we're doing in NCPI, NCPI right now that we feel should move towards a standard rather than just a convention? Okay, I should be counting seven seconds, right? <laughs> All right, well, if there isn't something that we um, uh, comes to mind immediately, just think about this from the perspective of, you know, how do we then not only consume standards from GA4GH, but also what are the opportunities to give back to the community and to propose new things that helped us fill a gap? So I just want people to keep that in mind. Um, okay, so I know I'm running low on time. Oh, um, Brian. We, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I think one thing from uh, the NCPI point of view, especially with the passport, uh, they are getting more, especially with the vision that you brought before, um, there's going to be the need to basically attach uh, the DERS uh, specification to the ISS that is basically managing the, the access to their resource. So basically, you do not know which visa you need to get, but you do know which uh, authority has basically the ability to say uh, if you can or not access to that um, type of data. And I think uh, uh, from 
what we see right now, especially with uh, Russ coming to play, a lot of the DB gap uh, um, related uh, will be basically easily solved with that uh, solution because basically Rust to rule them all. But for other type of data, they basically are consortium based, white list, they all these kind of things. Like who is the authority that basically give you access to that? You will need that right. to have that, that discovery mechanism built into theirs. And I think this is, is exactly what we will need to solve from an CPI perspective. And then we can bring as a driver project into the GH4GH. Uh, some work is already been going from last uh, fall, but I think last year, uh, but I think uh, it's time to revive because time is mature. At least that's my my suggestion. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I want to underscore what you're saying as well, which is, you know, I was kind of asking, like, are there any brand new things out there that we need to kind of pull into GA4GH? But as driver projects, we're giving feedback. I mean, we've already given a ton of feedback. Um, I know because I've been on those calls and I've I've been working on the pull request. We've given a ton of feedback on the Durst side, and I I absolutely agree with you, McKelly, that um, there are several things in the works for future versions of these APIs, especially Durst, that we will want to have land. Um, I don't think for milestone three. I think for milestone three we're okay, but right beyond milestone three, there's performance feedback that we want to give on Durst. There's things like paging that we want to do in Durst. There's the sort of discoverability of what broker, super useful when you suddenly have multiple brokers out there and it's not just go see RAS, right? So there's a lot of feedback here. It's not just new stuff, but it's also, we need to continue to give feedback. And I'll talk a little bit about FASP, um, I think on the next slide, um, uh, about how that's a really good conduit for us to give that feedback back as drivers. So Sarah or whoever's uh, doing the slide pack, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, I just let you know we are at lunchtime, so I understand if people need to to um, to head out, but we're wrapping it up shortly. Thank you all. Yes, I will be quick. I promise. <laughs> um, okay, so I've already talked about the starter kit. Why don't we go ahead and move on to the next slide? Um, great, thank you. So, so this is a great venue for talking about what what Michaela was just mentioning here. Um, we're already involved in this, but this is the Federated Analysis Systems Project. This is a working group within the GA4GH. And the goal here is to work directly with driver projects to demonstrate GA4GH APIs in the real world, what, driven by researcher use cases and real researchers, and then to generate feedback back to the APIs. This is exactly what we're doing in NCPI. This is exactly what we're doing in, in systems interop, where we have user use cases or researcher use cases. We're trying to perform their analysis using our interoperable systems and then we're generating feedback in the process. We've already actually participated in FASP in a very natural way. If you look at use case seven, which was Tim Majorian's use case that I talked about um, yesterday, um, that generated a ton of feedback that then went back through FASP. So I think there's, there's two things that we can use FASP for. This is a great conduit for letting the world know about what we're doing, the systems we're building, and this is also a great conduit for, as Michaela was mentioning, giving that critical feedback of, you know, Durst is great, but we need this, this, and this to actually be added to this next spec so we can do the work that we need to do to support our researcher use cases and our interoperability. So I, I personally think, and I'm a little bit biased here because I, I work on, on the FAST team, so I, I admit I'm biased, but I think this is a really great venue for us to interact with the GA4GH. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so um, the other uh, sort of venues, I just wanna point out, and this will be my last slide. Um, we have a GA4GH Connect meeting, and this is typically a much more technical meeting than the plenary that just happened last week. Um, this is a great meeting for folks to take a look at the agenda. There's a cloud work stream. There's a FASP uh, uh, group uh, meeting as part of Connect. I'd invite people, or I'd encourage people to come to the Connect meeting and the registration link is here. There's also the Genomics and Health Implementation Forum. Um, this is a, there's a meeting coming up in November. This is a forum for large scale projects, uh, national efforts to get together and share sort of best practices, what works, what works, what didn't work. Um, this might be a really great forum for, um, uh, for us, for NCPI, uh, to get to know and share our experiences and interoperability 
with other uh, large organizations around the world. Um, I'll do a plug again for FASP. We have regular bi-weekly meetings. And also there's really, there's other aspects of GA4GH as well in terms of like outreach. There's a equity, diversity and inclusion advisory group that I'd encourage folks to, to make connections with. Um, so really there's a lot of opportunities here, but I, I wanted to highlight these. So I know we're over time, so I'll stop, I'll, I'll stop talking. And I think I've got a few questions before we, we break for lunch. Valentina? Um, yes, Brian, uh, thank you for this. This has been great uh, for you to give this overview. Um, so my comment is not much technical, but more administrative. Um, and so GF4GH has been trying for some time to, um, they, have, they, have, they clearly want to engage in NIH, but NIH is not one entity, it's 27 institutes. <laughs> um, so they do not want to deal with 27 institutes, rightly so. Um, they, you know, they have X now, a small number of uh, NIH projects as driver projects, some of which us are part of NCPI. Um, uh, and so on. So one thing that we have been struggling um, is what is the appropriate level of engagement of GA4GH with the NIH? Um, <laughs> um, and so where is the proper interface? I think NCPI is, could be the right interface, one of the right interfaces, because we are trying to coordinate with, you know, several institutes, a few institutes with NCBI, we're trying different standards, we have provided feedback, uh, and so on. Yet, NCPI does not appear in any GA4GH website, any documentation, anything, right? So, um, in addition to getting engaged, I, I'm, I'm looking for suggestions on how to become more visible in the world of GA4GH as a project. Mm -hmm. And maybe the answer is, well, you know, we're still babies, uh, you know, it's still a baby project and maybe it doesn't deserve to be that. I would argue against it because I do think that, as pointed out by Robert before, I think in some cases we're ahead of, of them. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, do you have suggestions about how to solve this issue? Um, the other thing I also wanted to point out is that very often, um, the leadership of GA4GH is concerned because it is an international organization. It is concerned about uh, NIH to be the 1,000 pound gorilla <laughs> in the organization and it cannot be in a position to dictate what needs to happen in GA4GH. So that is also this concern that we have to deal with. Uh, so how, how, do you have a recommendation how to properly engage <laughs> with the organization and all their several things that they need to keep up with? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my personal opinion here is I think NCPI, you know, would be would be fantastic to have, to have a driver because, as you said, it brings together so many NIH folks. It would be, you know, great, right, to have that be a driver that allows us all to give feedback um, back and and work more directly with the the work streams. Um, I think the next step here is to reach out to the engagement. The the first or second slide that I showed that had the engagement. Um, process uh, link. Um, so to reach out to the G4GH leadership. Now, I know there's a practical thing here, which is the driver projects, the applications to become driver projects only open up every so often. So I think literally, I think we missed the window <laughs> as far as NCPI. Yeah. Um, it just didn't exist the last time they opened up and did a call for driver projects. So I think, Valentina, you and I can take this offline and, and talk to the, the leadership of GA4GH and find out the logistics of when the next opening is. Because I, I do think that NCPI is an excellent user of GA4GH APIs, and we're already giving feedback um, you know, through the driver projects that exist already and, and directly through FAST. So I think it's a really great relationship that we should lean into. Okay, thanks. Okay, one more question, Asiya. Yeah, so I actually similar with Valentina wondering how this uh, interaction actually happening, um, given Valentina already gave a bigger um, a background of how NIH in general interact with uh, GA4GH. 
So GA4GH has attended the last workshop and I had uh, some discussion with, with them uh, sometime earlier. And then we couldn't figure out how the NCPI will become a driver project. So my question to you, Brian, is that what does it entail to become a driver project for the GA4GH if NCPI as a whole as a drive project? And you already mentioned yeah. that there are some cases that is both uh, operating in the uh, GA4GH umbrella as well as the NCPI um, uh, umbrella. So what, what is the actual reactions that entails if we are starting interacting with GA4GH? Yeah, so the driver project, again, next time it opens up, the definition might be a little bit different. Um, I think we need to take this offline and talk to the GA4GH folks about the logistics of driver projects. But the last time this was open, driver projects need to be able to have some level of commitment um, they need to have some level of consistent engagement with one or more work streams and have staff that's been dedicated to have at least part of their time doing that interaction. I think though naturally we've kind of, one, working with uh, some of the NCPI participants that are already driver projects, that are already showing up for the various work stream calls, are already kind of propagating information and feedback from NCPI and also participating in FASP. Um, you know, are, are places where we're already giving feedback. So I think in terms of, you know, what would it change for NCPI to be a driver? Um, I think the day-to-day -day and our propagation of information back to GA4GH and getting help from GA4GH with their standards, not much would change there because we're already doing a good job, I think, of engagement. I think it would give us wider engagement across other um, NCPI systems that aren't now driver projects, and that would be a good thing. Um, but I think what we can do is um, we can take this conversation offline and just have a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, with the GA4GH folks and find out what the, the steps forward are. Yeah, but I, Brian, I, I would I would point out, I, th I think, first of all, GA4GH is in its infancy in terms of developing things. We're, we're struggling at the level of AAI and passports and just barely getting to the level of DERS and uh, NIH is well represented in both of those already and mm -hmm. has been has been yeah. for, for years so I, I, I don't think there's uh, as much to discuss as as maybe has been implied. Yeah no I, I agree with what you're saying on the technical side I think we're well connected and that's a really good thing. Um, in terms of visibility, though, I think this is what Valentina and SCI are getting to, is visibility that we are working, you know, across NCPI would be a good thing. Um, the um, uh, uh, genomic, uh, sorry, I'm getting the acronym wrong, uh, Genomics and Health Implementers Forum, Valentina and SCI, I think that would be another great place uh, to engage with. So I'd encourage us to have folks come to connect and come to uh, the Genomics and Health Implementation Forum. Uh, in November. But Kurt, you're right. Like, I feel like we're really well connected with GA4GH. And I feel like we have a really good relationship in terms of getting things changed based on really helpful feedback coming from our, our use cases and our actual implementations. Okay, I think we're well over. So <laughs> apologies. I think everyone wants lunch now. Thanks, Brian. Yes, we will uh, re reconvene at two o'clock. I know um, that some NIH folks have a separate meeting that will not be on this Zoom. I believe there's been a separate invitation sent for that. So we will see you all back here at two o'clock. Thanks so much. <laughs>